You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 103, brought to you by Vessi Seeds. Uh, hey, it's Greg here, and um, I'm in the uh, <laughs> outdoor recording studio for windy days. Uh, I think you've noticed this year I've been uh, filming the uh, the podcast outdoors, the ones where I'm, I'm just talking to you and I don't have a guest. I try to have a guest every other episode sort of thing. It's a lot more work to coordinate a guest and that sort of thing. Um, these videos are more convenient. And I, it's just a different sort of format uh, when I do these. It's more like I'm having a conversation with you and uh, speaking, you know, focusing on one issue that I get a lot of questions about or something that uh, is just on my mind, that sort of thing. Uh, it's kind of windy today, so uh, I normally like to film these in the garden, in a garden setting. It's kind of windy today, so this is a little, <laughs> a little clearing in the forest behind my house. Uh, so this is a nice sort of pleasant setting, and you can see the the changing, uh, the signs of the changing of the seasons, season, some of the uh, foliage is starting to change color and that sort of thing. It's, uh, <clears throat> I think it's October 2nd as I record this today. What am I going to talk about today? Uh, a sort of general topic, uh, what to plant and how much of it to plant, I guess we could say, or how to avoid throwing away the stuff you've planted, or how to avoid having so much stuff come out of your garden that you're, you're walking the streets of your neighborhood with bowls of beans and stuff, uh, begging people to take it off your hands. Uh, I think that's, the, or, or you're you know, putting your garden away for the winter and you're just looking at all these different things you didn't eat that didn't get used, right? I find it really demoralizing as a gardener. And I've had years where I, that's been the case and every year I try to uh, improve my plan for my garden so that uh, I'm not in that situation so that everything's being used. I mean, sure, if, if, if your personality type is, is such that you just enjoy, um, you know, giving stuff away from your garden and you've got lots of friends, um, neighbors or whatever that really appreciate it and, you know, they're, every year they're saying, oh, when you're going to have uh, your kale, I really like it, that sort of thing. You know, I derive pleasure from that sort of thing too. Um, but, uh, you know, these days, uh, you know, people not... I find people, uh, generally speaking, they, they kind of prefer to get the, the vegetable in the bag that's been all sort of cut up for them, right? Uh, which is a mentality I don't really understand. Like, that's the way babies think. Like, oh, you want to cut your potatoes up for you, cut your carrots up for you. Uh, but seeing people see, you know, they want their lettuce in a bag and it doesn't look like a plant anymore. It's just a, a plastic bag with pieces of lettuce in it. They take it out there. Maybe they, maybe they rinse it off and then they eat it. Uh, they have their cut up carrots or their cut up this or their cut up that. Um, it seems to be uh, people are losing that connection with uh, the natural thing that comes out of the ground. And also just a preference for driving to the grocery store um, as opposed to just walking into one's own backyard, you know, for a minute or two grabbing something that grew out of the ground and uh, processing that and turning that into something good to eat. You know, using your kitchen skills, using those, those sort of old world skills to, uh, to take the, the vegetable clean it, process it, and cook it. Uh, I think those things are viewed as inconvenient and time consuming. They're really not. Once you get in the, once you get the hang of it, once you get into the routine of it, um, you know, it becomes more like a discipline or like, you know, I think of someone, you know, getting up every morning and going through their Tai Chi or whatever it is they, that's not my thing at all, uh, your yoga or whatever. But for me, like my yoga is like, you know, peeling potatoes, <laughs> peeling carrots and getting them ready. Uh, I sort of, every time I, just like a martial art, every time I do that processing uh, a vegetable, uh, I'm trying to figure out a slightly better way to do it. Uh, the most efficient way to use my hands and the tool to get that vegetable into a state where it can be cooked. Uh, and I enjoy the process and I'm, I'm, I'm 48 and, um, you know, these are all things I've done a million times. And every time I do them, I either, you know, take pleasure in my ability to process the vegetable well or take a keen interest in applying a new technique. And I'm always watching, um, you know, it's funny, I have a gardening channel and that's the main thing I do. I do some cooking videos because uh, to me it's part of gardening and you grow it to eat it. Um, but I don't really watch, um, um, I hardly watch any gardening podcasts. Uh, sometimes uh, in the winter, in the dead of winter, I might watch the odd one. Um, but uh, I, I tend not to watch them because 
if you watch a lot, if, if you have a, if you're a YouTuber and you've got a channel and you put out a lot of videos and you're watching another channel on the same topic, you, you, you just, you can't help it. You end up sort of setting up your channel to almost be a conversation with that other channel, right? Or you start copying material and you just lose, you know, whatever makes your, your content unique, you, you lose that, that, that mojo, I guess. <laughs> so I don't tend to watch, uh, or I'll find I'm watching another um, gardening channel because one of my viewers say, hey, have you seen this guy? He says this thing. Um, so when I watch whoever that is, it's often Charles Dowding because uh, I have a no, no till approach, no dig approach, and so to see, but we come at it completely differently. Also, by the way, we're in different countries, right? Um, but anyway, uh, whenever I watch a child's doubting video, uh, I want to do a video on all the reasons I disagree with him. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, and it really, it, it's, I don't think people want to see me do that, honestly, because um, you know, 95% of the issues, uh, uh, or 95% of uh, gardening related matters, I agree with them, right? So why would I want to set myself as opposed to someone that I 95% agree with? It, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And uh, it, would, it would come off like a clickbait hit piece type thing. So I try to stay, I try to stay away from it. And, and so the best way for me to avoid being inspired to make videos like that is to just not watch um, the other uh, content creator stuff and just just come out in the garden go to work and usually the ideas come or I have a viewer question that I think that'd be a great you know if I have a viewer question that uh, the answer is going to take me more than two or three sentences to answer um, that's usually a video I'll make a note to make a video about that and for those of you that follow along the podcast and follow along with everything if I've ever told you that I'm going to make a video um, about a question you've had and I didn't make that video please put a comment in this video and tell me because I just forgot that's all uh, I usually have a I have a file on my computer where I write down like video ideas um, and I usually have like post-it notes all over the place so ideally I jot it down on a piece of paper and it finds its way into the notepad file on my computer and then if I'm ever in a situation where I want to try to make one or two videos a week I can't think of anything I've got a long list of things to make videos of um, but sometimes it doesn't, the idea doesn't find its way from the scrap of paper I've got or the post-it note to the computer file and just gets lost. So if I've ever told you I'm going to make a video about that, whatever your question was, and I didn't, it's, it's been lost, it's been crushed. That notion, that idea has been crushed under the wheels of history. So please uh, put a comment in this video and remind me and uh, I'll make it, I'll put it on my list. But anyway, back to our topic here. I don't know how I got off of this, but... Um, to, for me, the best way to, and I have a, a huge garden, right? Much larger garden than, of course, there's people with gardens bigger than mine, but compared to most home gardeners with a backyard garden, um, I, I don't really know anyone <laughs> with a garden as large as mine. Uh, maybe there might be one or two people I work with that, um, you know, they, their garden sounds similar in size and scope and scale. Um, and sure, there's lots of people with larger, but my, my point is that, you know, I grow, let's say it's 2,500 square feet, but that doesn't really give you a sense of the size and scale. So let's just say about 40 four by eight beds. It's not organized all into four by eight beds, but just to use that as a, a unit of measurement sort of thing, a four by eight bed. I've got about 40 of those. You know, that, that, if, you, if you took all the spaces I've got, they're all different shapes, right? But if you took them all and uh, took that square footage and divided it by four by eight sort of thing, right? Um, 32 square feet. You probably get about that many units of 32 square feet, uh, four by eight. So um, I, I grow that much stuff. I, I give very little. It's not that I'm greedy. I just, I use it all. You know, I, I, over the years, I've just gotten better and better and better at um, developing a system, choosing what I plant and when I plant it, in such a way that I'm using all of that space and nothing is going to waste. And I would say that the key consideration when you're doing that is to plant a lot of things that can be stored, right? Um, and you won't necessarily get the best advice from watching different garden gurus, as they don't tend to come at it from that point of view. 
Um, they tend to come at it like, let's grow something that looks really nice. How do you get it to grow? That, that tends to be, how do you get it to grow, the question. As opposed to, I mean, what's the point of growing it? The, the point of growing it is food, right? And if you're growing, you know, like, why, like for instance, why would I want to have five beds of lettuce, right? Um, once the lettuce, you know, there's a certain time of year when the lettuce is good. And then let's say by around July, your lettuce all starts to make flowers, it bolts, and it's all useless and you can't keep up with it. So there's, there's certain kinds of things you, you don't want to have a lot of because it, it, it's, it, it just stops being available during the season. And there's other things that they don't store really well at all, like lettuce. And so you, you're growing it to eat it fresh. Um, and you can only eat so much of it a week, right? Um, you now, if you're a person that eats lettuce every single day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, maybe you want to grow a lot of lettuce, right? Um, but for me, uh, I tend to gravitate towards things that can be stored. So, you know, you have a space, and this is going to be different for everyone depending on how large your garden is. You, the challenge is to plan out the gardening season. Think about the things you like to eat, the things that um, your family, if, you, if, you, if, you, if there's more than one of you, and um, the things that your family likes to eat, and think about how much of that you're going to eat during a given growing season, and also how much, if it's something, if you're growing something you can store, uh, how much of that you can set aside reasonably, right, and uh, use up, consume over the course of late fall, winter, early spring, when you're really not getting anything out of your garden. I mean, there's a handful of things that you can get out of your garden for the entire, you know, distance of the growing season. Um, so I tend to gravitate towards those. So let me just run through the things I have in my garden. This isn't an exhaustive list, um, but just to give you a sense of where I'm coming from, uh, I would say probably two thirds of the space in my garden uh, and this is setting aside perennials, okay? So just things I plant every year, not perennials, okay? Because, you know, maybe a quarter of the space in my garden is perennials, right? Maybe maybe 20%, slightly less than a quarter. I've got different berries and things like that, rhubarb and stuff like that, right? Might even be less than a quarter. But anyway, let's, let's say it's 20% or 15% of the space is, is devoted to perennials. So setting that space aside talking about stuff you plant and it grows and it comes out and it's done for that year. Um, I would say two-thirds of that space, at least two-thirds, is uh, things that are very easy to store and store very well, um, almost effortless to store. So we're talking uh, root vegetables and winter squash primarily, right? So I might have a bed of uh, one bed of salsify. Actually, this year my salsify was kind of a fail. Uh, didn't I don't, a lot of my things like carrots and salsify? They all got wiped out in a, in a matter of days because we had a, a population explosion here of chipmunks. I think it was chipmunks, and they just came in and wiped a lot of things out. So um, that was a bit of a problem. We had to overcome that. Um, but anyway, one bed of salsify. I like to have two beds of carrots. Carrots are very easy to store. Um, you, you, you know, you, you plant them as early as you can in the spring and once they're established, you mulch them and then maybe around, uh, oh, July or August, you thin them out a little bit. Um, you start using them, but you know, you can, you can use them all summer long as, as, you know, once they get to a certain size, but you tend to, you know, at least for me, I, I harvest them with an interest of thinning them. I leave the beds sort of alone until around, we start getting frost in the fall around now. Uh, but even then, I don't harvest all of them uh, this time of year. I leave them in the ground until there's a risk of the ground freezing around them. <laughs> the longer you can leave them, they're just they're continuing to grow, but they're actually going to get all that cold weather and frost makes a carrot taste better. And the same can be said for parsnips and salsify, that whole family of root vegetables, you know, tough, cold hardy root vegetables. I tend to leave them in the ground until we've had like a snow or the ground is at risk of freezing and they're going to be locked in there sort of thing. Uh, but then all you got to do to store them is you, you, you pick them, you sort of dry, you know, you lay them out on a piece of cardboard. I like to do this on my garage. Uh, lay them out on a piece of cardboard and uh, 
and turn a fan on and just let them sit like that for a day or two with the, with, you know, with the lights off in the dark. And that dries them out a little bit, the surface. And I don't really clean them. I just I pick them on a day when it's not wet and mucky sort of thing. So there's not a lot of dirt on them anyway. But you just pick them out of the ground, dust them off very gently and lay them on the garage floor, uh, get them dry. And you just put them in cardboard boxes. You, you'd have a you know, layer of carrots, newspaper or cardboard, another layer of carrots. Just fill the box up like that, close the lid. Don't, don't seal it up with tape, just close the lid on the box. And if, you know, for me, I just leave it on the concrete floor of my garage in the winter. It's around you know, somewhere between five and eight degrees Celsius, you know, just above freezing, and the storage is fine, right? All the root vegetables I grow, I store like that. So I'll have two beds of carrots because they're, they're effortless to grow during the growing season and they're effortless to store. I mean, some people can them and do all that sort of stuff. Uh, they taste so much better if you just store them as a root vegetable. You know, by around March, they, they'll get a bit uh, rubbery. Um, like they're not, they don't snap anymore. They get a bit more, more bendy sort of thing. But they, they, if anything, they taste better by that time of year. I find a lot of root vegetables, when they've been stored, they just seem to improve in flavor. Um, even if the texture seems a bit odd. Um, that texture doesn't really matter because you're going to be, I, I usually roast them, right? I use them in other ways, stir fries and stuff like that too. But the bulk of my carrots, uh, especially when the weather starts getting colder, I like doing a lot of roast dinners. Roasted carrots, roasted beets, roasted parsnips, roasted potatoes, roast beef, roast chicken, roast duck. <laughs> That's sort of whatever, right? Everything's roasted and there's a gravy and, and you're just eating all these root vegetables and you're putting on all this fat for the winter sort of thing, right? Um, so... That's the way I like to store them because it's just so darn easy. So I'll have about two beds of carrots. I'll have about six beds of potatoes, at least. And if there's any extra space anywhere, I'll, I'll plant more potatoes um, because they, they store ex they're extremely, I mean, they, you store them exactly the way I just explained with the carrots, right? Um, they store extremely easily. Um, the most important thing, and I've got videos on this with potatoes, it's very important to sort them out, the ones that are perfectly intact and have all of their integrity and the ones that have maybe a hole in them or something like that. My kids are old enough now, I can, I can lay them out on the floor and just get them to sort them out like that. So the ones that are compromised in any way, you use those up, they're still usable, you just have to cut away the bad parts. So you use those up right away. Those are your potatoes for eating in the fall, right? And then all the other ones, you put them in the boxes and you've got them for December, January, February, March, you know, and so on and, forth, so on and so on and so forth. Usually mine lasts me till around the end of March. And then, um, you know, uh, we just uh, take a break from potatoes, <laughs> you know, and just enjoy other, you know, uh, you know, I'd say at least a third of all our, our meals are some form of starch, right? Um, so we just take a break from potatoes and move on to different things, rice and, you know, pasta and things like that. Um, so yeah, six beds of potatoes. Um, I like to have uh, two beds of beets. I like to have uh, at least three beds of winter squash. Uh, I couldn't think of an easier thing to store than winter squash, right? You, you pick them, you know, you want to pick them before there's any frost. Um, and you put them in a, you know, cool, dark place, a cold room, or in my, in my case, a shelf in my garage. Um, and then you just use them as you need, uh, you know, every, at least once a week. From this week onward, once a week, we're going to eat a squash, right? One of the different kinds of squash I grew. They, you know, they're just almost designed in their own wrapper, right? They're just a wonderful uh, thing to grow. So I grow a lot of that because I don't really do anything. I mean, you know, you get the plant established, you have a good mulch, and the plant just takes care of, care of itself. And then around September, you, you pick the, the squash, the winter squash. You know, it's like butternut squash, acorn squash, things like that, right? Georgia candy roaster squash and stick it inside. I find uh, with squash, maybe sometimes around, uh, you know, late February, March, uh, some of them might start getting soft spots. So at that point, you got to process them all, uh, cook them, and you can, you can, even at that point, you can still use them. You process them, you cook them into like a mush, <laughs> and you just put them in containers in your freezer, and you still got them stored, and you can still use them. So even when they start to go bad, you can drop everything and process them and just freeze them and eat them from there, right? So yeah, at least three beds of squash is what I like to grow. Um, parsnip, two beds of parsnips. And um, garlic and onions, right? Those store very easily. I mean, all you literally do is pick them and same process as the carrots. Pick them, dry them out, stick them in a box. Or with, gar with garlic, you stick them in a brown paper bag, stick them on a shelf in the garage, use them as we need them. Really easy. 
um, and a, another low maintenance plan. You know, no, no work involved. You plant them around this time of year, and then you don't do anything till you know you pick the garlic scapes, and then you know sometime in August you pick the garlic, dry them out. <laughs> it's so easy, right? Um, so those are all storage vegetables, things that you're, you're growing to just store them and they're very easy to store. So that's at least two thirds of my garden is devoted to stuff like that. So, you know, those are all things that are almost no work to grow and almost no work to process and save because you're really not processing them. You're just drying them out, sticking them in a box, right? So it's a lot of, it's, you know, so that's two thirds of my, my, my sort of annuals, you know, the part of my garden that's annual uh, right there. Um, and it all gets used, right? Because I can use it later. It's not going to go bad, or it's going to go bad very slowly, right? And then I've got the other things, the annuals that um, aren't easy to store, right? Um, some of them you have to eat, some of them just can't be stored in any way, and some of them can e be eaten fresh or stored, right? So things like kale. I, I tend to have two beds of kale, and I actually might even get away from that. You know, one bed of kale is a lot of kale. It's one bed of kale will give you all the kale you want during a week, at least for me anyway. And we eat it, I'd say three meals a week involve kale. Yeah, when I say meal, I mean like a supper time meal. Um, so, you know, if you're eating kale for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, maybe you want more than that. Um, but even then, um, kale is one of those plants where um, you can cook it when it's fresh, but you can also blanch and freeze it. You know, you blanch it and pack it into a little cake and freeze it like that. So, you know, it's a thing that you can eat fresh, but also store. So if, it, if, the, if the kale plants are out producing your ability to keep up with them, you know, if, if, the, if the, uh, the leaves are starting to lose their color, you know, if you see the leaves losing their color on the plant, it means that you're not harvesting the leaves at a rate uh, that's keeping up with the growth rate of the plant. So, you know, you might want to, if that's happening, grow less kale, or every time you harvest kale, harvest twice as much as you can eat and uh, freeze and blanch half of it, right? Um, so kale's a great plant because it can be eaten fresh but also stored. Uh, Swiss chard's another one. It can be eaten fresh and stored, and kale and Swiss chard grow right up until like October, November, right? Uh, even, kale's even tougher than Swiss chard. Um, the really hard frost will kind of liquefy Swiss chard, but kale can take being frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed. It's invincible. I have kale grown in my garden usually till December. Um, um, uh, beans are another one where you eat them fresh and they're wonderful fresh out of the garden, but you can blanch and freeze them. So I grow beets, be, or I grow at least two beds of beans. Sometimes I grow three, but it's really too much. I can't keep up with it. Um, so, and I also, you know, recommend having some of your beans as bush beans and some of your beans as the tall pole beans, um, because the, the, you know, ones that grow up indeterminate growing habit, because they come in later, right? So you have a, if you have, if you grow a lot of bush beans, then you kind of pick them all at the same time. It's a bit exhausting. So if you grow, let's say half your beans as bush and half your beans as pole, um, the pole beans just start producing when the bush beans are kind of getting they're done, right? So it's not overwhelming. You can keep up with it. And beans are great because you can eat them fresh or freeze them, right? So then have them for later. So you can you can eat them all. <laughs> as long as you as long as you're blanching and freezing them and keeping up with what the plants are producing, right? You can only eat so many beans per week. Um, but you can blanch and freeze them and eat the eat the excess later. So it's a great plant like that. Um, tomatoes, you know, in my family growing up, everybody loved tomatoes. We couldn't get enough of them. In the family that I've created here, <laughs> I'm the big fan of tomatoes. Um, you know, we, sure, we, 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 we eat pasta a lot, you know, the spaghetti and that sort of thing, the lasagna and all those sorts of things. Um, it's a lot of work to take uh, Roma tomatoes, you know, that sort of uh, sauce tomatoes, and turn them into tomato sauce. We, we tend to just buy, buy that. Sounds lazy, but so I only grow one bed of tomatoes, and they're, you know, half of the bed is Roma tomatoes, and I use those to uh, actually ferment them and use them as a, a cooking ingredient as a fermented tomato. I, tend to, I find they tend to add a lot of flavor to stir fries, pastas, different kinds of dishes. I actually just filmed a video um, a week ago on how to ferment um, tomatoes, but I didn't have my damn microphone on. One of my viewers, um, uh, what's the guy's name? Chessy, I think, <laughs> wanted me to do a video on uh, fermenting tomatoes. And I did it, but the microphone wasn't on my camera, so all that, you know, all that material is lost. 
That was a shame. But anyway, I grow half the bed is um, Roma tomatoes that I can use for fermenting because they're just such a great ingredient to add to things. And uh, the other half is um, kind of a beef steak because I like a tomato sandwich. And I usually grow one or two uh, cherry tomato plants because they come in a bit sooner and they're just nice to have when you're out in the garden as a little snack. And my, my daughter likes the cherry tomatoes as well. Um, but yeah, I know a lot of my viewers when they find out I only have one bed of tomatoes, they're appalled because so for, for so many people, tomatoes are the star of the show in the garden. Um, and uh, I grow uh, only one bed of summer squash. I grow zucchini, I grow one bed of it, and it's all the squash I can handle. I, I may make like, you know, uh, um, you know, maybe uh, a dozen quarts of zucchini relish. Um, we eat zucchini all the time, every way we possibly can. Uh, so one bed of zucchini, summer squash zucchini is all we need. I usually have one bed of uh, peppers, a combination of peppers and eggplants. This year the eggplants uh, kind of, I don't know why, but they just failed. Um, but, you know, uh, they're, they're, I would grow more of them because I like them. And uh, both those things, there's ways to store them. Um, but they're very challenging to grow here. And you've got to put a lot of time and energy into getting them to work. And even then, sometimes it doesn't work out because you just have a lousy spring and an early uh, frost in the fall. So um, I don't, I don't want to commit a lot to, uh, to growing them. They just don't work here so well. Uh, this year, peppers worked out pretty good. Um, and then I usually have a bed of pumpkin because it's nice to put them on the, you know, uh, front step in the fall uh, as, a, as a decoration. I grow a variety that um, tends to uh, taste good as well, so I recommend that. So it's, kind of, it's just kind of a waste of garden space to grow a pumpkin you can't eat, right? Uh, so there's a pumpkin. And then, of course, there's the berries and the, all the different perennials, the herbs and all that sort of stuff. So that's how so when you look at that list oh and of course i grow some lettuce and spinach uh early in the spring i i i do play around with doing a fall I, in in let's say first week of august i plant lettuce and spinach to harvest in the fall um, but it's so dry that time of year you really have to look after those plants they're not when you plant lettuce and spinach in the spring it, it's being you know it, it's it's being nursed along by the sky, right? At least where I live here in April, right? It rains almost every other day, right? So it's, it's not very challenging to get, so get to get a seed to get started that time of year. Um, in the fall, or sorry, in, in August, it's very dry here, for, for here anyway. Probably wet compared to some other places, but I, you know, it takes a bit of work to get those things to grow. So I, I, you know, I tend to do most of my spinach and lettuce eating in the early season. And uh, from Ju July onwards, we, we, the greens that are coming out of the garden are primarily things like kale, Swiss chard, collard greens, you know, things like that. And I didn't mention as well broccoli. I, I like to have one bed of broccoli. Uh, it's usually a combination of broccoli and cauliflower. Uh, I enjoy that. They can be blanched and frozen, and maybe I could do more of that in a given year. But there's another plant that, you know, you can eat it fresh out of the garden, but it can also be blanched and frozen, bagged up and saved for later. So that's how you avoid having all that stuff go to waste. Also having, planting a variety of broccoli like I do, uh, broccolini, um, instead of having one big head, it, it produces multiple little heads. And so every week you can go out and harvest broccoli for, for months, right? From, you know, starting sometime in July, right up until like, I'm still harvesting broccoli, those same broccoli plants now, right? Uh, it's with a variety called Artwork Broccolini. Um, just a great plant to have in your garden. It just keeps giving and giving and giving and giving and giving, right? So, you, you know, one nice dish a week with broccoli in it, right? And if I planted more of that, I could take the florets and blanch and freeze them and have them for the winter. So there's another plant where you can come at it from that point of view. Um, and of course, we've got all the different uh, perennials and lots and lots of different herbs, and they're pretty low maintenance. Um, you know, I don't like to see the herbs go to waste either. So, um, you know, there's a certain time of the year for every single herb where it's big. I cut it off and I lay it out on a, a sort of a, um, like, a, it's like a, it's a piece of a fence. <laughs> and I hang it in my gardening shed and let the herbs dry out. I should do a video on that, I suppose. I got, a, I got that thing. It's a whole, like it's all, it looks like a door, right? It looks like a sieve, a giant rectangular sieve, you know. And uh, I just lay all the herbs on that and leave them in the gardening shed for two or three weeks until they're dry enough that they're brittle. 
and then I just sort of smush them all up and get them into a bag and that's how I save my herbs. I also, uh, early in the year when I have garlic scapes, make a lot of different pestos with my herbs and I put those in the freezer. All of that gets used, you know, right? All the garlic scapes, I have six beds of garlic. I grow like 200 some, 250 garlic a year. And every one of those garlics give me a scape that I take off. And it, all of those scapes uh, appear and are removed in a matter of a couple weeks. There's no way I could eat all that fresh. Um, but you can turn it into a pesto and I've made videos on how to do that. Then you've got that for whenever you want it. You just put it in your freezer. It stores really, really well. So um, that's the general <laughs> the approach, right? You have, you, you have a space. You use all of the space. Have a plan to use it all. Um, have a, you know, if, if you watch my garden plan video, I do one of these videos. It's, it's, it's not a podcast like this. It's a, you know, video. Uh, I do a garden plan video usually around uh, January or February, around the time that everybody's buying seeds, because that's when I'm thinking about it, right? So I'm thinking about what I'm going to plant, where is it going to go? I don't want to, sometimes you overbuy seeds, you buy more seeds than you could possibly find a space for in your garden in any meaningful way. So I tend to plant out my garden, where is everything going to go? And uh, I'm, I'm thinking about how much of that can I eat? You know, how much is too much? And every year I make little notes, you planted too much of this, you didn't plant enough of that. Like this year, for instance, I had three beds of bush beans. I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to make a note for myself. It's just too much beans coming in at once. We were just sick and tired of having to do Every day or every other day when I came home from work, I had to blanch and freeze beans. Uh, we have a ridiculous amount of beans in our freezer right now. And that's, that's nice, but they actually didn't all get used up. It was just too many, too many beans to stay on top of. I, I honestly think that one bed of, um, one bed of bush and another bed with the, uh, pole beans. I like to use a rattlesnake pole beans. That's a snap bean, not the drying kind. That works out good for me. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the general idea. That's the, this week's podcast. Uh, just some ideas about how to avoid the situation where you just planted too much and you don't know what to do with it and you're overwhelmed and you're either begging people to take it off your hands or just watching it all rot in your garden. Uh, that can be demoralizing for a gardener. So uh, try to avoid it. Have a plan. Think about how much you eat of all the things you want to grow. You know, think about can those things be stored? How easily can they be stored? You know, you might come up with a plan. Oh, I'm just going to can everything. You know, pressurize. That's a lot of work, right? So think about how much patience you have for canning and how much help you have and that sort of stuff, right? Think that all through. And if you haven't done any canning before, there's a lot of stuff you have to buy to make that happen. Right? Whereas with a lot of root vegetables, you just put them in cardboard boxes. <laughs> so you can get those for free, right? Some of the grocery stores around here, they have them, you know, near the checkout. You can just put your groceries in a box and walk out. You get a free box, right? So um, I hope you found that interesting and you got some useful um, pearls of wisdom there, perhaps. Um, if you uh, enjoy these podcasts um, and you want to help support the show, um, check out my sponsor, Vessi Seeds. They make this all possible. They pay for the camera gear, they pay for the web hosting that I use, the service that I use, um, and uh, you know any sort of uh, labor that I get done around here. Once a year, I usually hire a young guy to help me out for a couple days. That all comes out of my Vessi's <laughs> money sort of thing, right? So it doesn't cost me anything to do that sort of stuff. So uh, you know that just helps make this stuff uh, just easier for me. Uh, to provide and more, you know, less of a less of a drain on me to provide. So um, yeah, if you want to help support the show, check out their website when you're buying your seeds. We got a coupon code uh, for this year. It's GAVS20. I'm talking with them right now about setting up something up for next year. Hopefully, we'll make that happen. So stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, if they sell something that you need, buy it from them. Use the coupon code to get free shipping. That'll help support the show. So. All that being said, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching.